morning, everyone, and welcome out there to White Branch Church this morning. Uh, we're going to be starting with our opening song, and my uh, beautiful niece-in-law is going to lead singing today, Pam. this through twice he is Lord Scripture reading for today is Genesis 17, 1 through 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. 
Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Good morning. Good morning. One town was dealing with a problem of squirrel infestations. I got this one from Barbara. <laughs> Here is how a few of the religious organizations handled the problem. The Presbyterian Church called a meeting to decide what to do about their squirrel infestation. After much prayer and consideration, they concluded the squirrels were predestined to be there so they would not interfere with God's divine will and they left the squirrels. At the Brethren Church, the squirrels had taken an interest in the baptistry. The deacons met and decided to put a water slide in the baptistry and let the squirrels drown themselves. But the squirrels liked the slide, and unfortunately, they knew how to swim. So twice as many squirrels showed up the following week. The Lutheran church decided they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures. So they humanely trapped their squirrels and set them free near the Brethren church. <laughs> but two weeks later, the squirrels were back because the Brethren had taken down the water slide. The Episcopalians tried a more unique path by setting out pans of whiskey around the church in an effort to kill the squirrels with alcohol poisoning. They sadly learned how much damage a band of drunk squirrels can do. The Catholic Church tried something else. They baptized the squirrels, made them members, and they see them only now at Christmas and Easter. <laughs> Finally, there wasn't much from the Jewish synagogue. They took the first squirrel, circumcised him, and they haven't seen one since. <laughs> so today, yes, we are talking about circumcision. It's maybe not the most comfortable topic to bring up, but we do need to recognize this is a very significant topic in the scripture. And it goes all the way back to this scripture of Genesis 17 when God made a covenant with Abraham in circumcision. So this is where we see this covenant begin. Throughout the rest of the Bible, this is going to be a very important topic. Throughout the Old Testament as a way of keeping the covenant in the New Testament where they had to make the decision, do they continue with this practice or not? So we're going to go through all of that today, but first we're going to look at the fact that God is a God of covenants. But let's talk about what is a covenant. A covenant is an oath-bound agreement between two parties. A covenant always has a sign attached to it that you are in covenant. And the highest sign entailed giving of one's blood. This was a practice, particularly in this day, in the Old Testament days, where two parties would come together and they would enter into a covenant with each other. And the highest form of entering into that covenant was some form of shedding blood on both sides. Both parties offering some sort of cut. In fact, the literal translation from the Old Testament is not make a covenant, but cut a covenant. Because the cutting was saying we were entering into covenant together and blood was involved. Sometimes they mixed that blood. Sometimes they might have mixed that blood with wine. Sometimes they took a sip of that with each other, recognizing our blood has now become one. All of those were practices of the day, and this idea of covenant was a very strong understanding in Genesis. Unfortunately, in our own society today, we don't have a very strong understanding of covenant. 
for a lot of us, we think of agreements as something you write on paper and you can get out of if you don't want to keep it. But in the days of Genesis, when the covenant was made, and the biblical understanding of covenant, especially when you put your blood in it, was that you were committed to it till death. And the only way out of that was you dying. And to break the covenant would entail a massive response on the other side. Now, if you want to understand the whole Old Testament, then understand what's taking place here. And the New Testament is based off of what takes place here. In fact, the very word testament comes from the Latin word for covenant. So you could just as easily say the Old Covenant and the New Covenant when you're looking at Old Testament and New Testament. Or the First Covenant and the New Covenant. Either way you want to look at that, that word is covenant. So let's look at Genesis 17, 1 here. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord God appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, or El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant. Now, they have already been working through this covenant up until this point, Genesis 12, Genesis 14, Genesis 15. But they're taking a step forward now in this covenant. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. He's reverent, he's worshiping, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. And now he's going to begin to lay out this covenant. He begins with his side of the covenant, of what he will do for Abram. You will be the father of many nations. Now this time, Abram has one child. His name's Ishmael. He's 13 years old. That's the only child Abram has. But he says, you will be the father of many nations. In fact, no longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father, but your name will be Abraham, father of many. For I have made you a father of many nations. And he changes his name, which often takes place in spiritual times of the life of people in the Bible. Saul begins to be known as Paul. Simon becomes known as Peter. Abram becomes known as Abraham. Even in our own culture, when we think of a wedding covenant, the bride will change their name to the husbands. And so we see a name change is often a significant relationship to the relationship of covenant with God. And he says, I have made you the father of many nations. Verse 6, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And God is saying, on my end, you can count on my end of the covenant. I will keep my side of the covenant. This will be what will happen. Similarly, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, when we read the new covenant and the promises we have with God and the words that he has shared, we need to recognize God is faithful on his side of the covenant. But now, in verse 7, he transitions here. It says, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So he says, this is a covenant I'm making not just with you as an individual, but I'm making this covenant with your descendants. And now uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 9. I'll come back to 8 in a minute here. But verse 9, then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you for the generations to come. And if you want to understand the Old Testament, that verse right there explains what's going on. I'm making a covenant. I'll be faithful on my end. Now you've got to keep your end. You need to keep your side of the covenant. And it begins... With circumcision. Look at verse 10. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That's the first step of entering into the covenant. For them, that was their entrance. That was their commitment to the covenant. What does circumcision entail? First of all, it entails blood. Right? So they're shedding blood on their behalf saying, I am entering into this blood covenant with you. And I'm giving my very life to it. <clears throat> what does it also entail? It tells something that can't be reversed. It's irreversible. I'm entering into an irreversible covenant with you. Something that will last. It's not something I'm going to change my mind. I'm entering into it and I'm fully committed. So the covenant of circumcision was the entrance point into it or saying that we are agreeing on this covenant. We are in this together. Now the whole rest 
of the first five books of the Bible are known as the Law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What are those? That's the Law of Moses, yes, but it's the terms of the covenant. It begins here, Genesis 17. It's the first book, but it's not the final book. It's not the only thing they were required to do was to be circumcised. It ended up being 613 commandments through the Old Testament that they were to keep on their end of the covenant. God said, I will do my side, now I'm asking you to do your side. And if they were unfaithful to their side, there was consequences. Deuteronomy 28, for example, says, if you do not keep all these laws, then here's what's going to happen to you. You are breaking your end of the covenant. If you keep all of these laws, here's what's going to happen to you. You'll be blessed with all my blessings because I will keep my end of the covenant. That's why the first five books of the Bible for the Jew is the most important because those are the terms of the covenant. What happens after that? The rest of the Old Testament is commentary on that. Did they keep it? Did they not? Were they faithful? Were they not? And when they weren't, what would God do? He would send prophets and call them back to the terms of the covenant. You're not being faithful to the covenant. All this stuff's going to happen to you if you continue being unfaithful. That's why a lot of the prophets sound like doom and gloom sometimes. Because they are calling them back to the covenant. But if you return, if you repent, that language continues over and over. Return, repent, come back, fulfill the covenant, then you'll be blessed. So we see in the whole Old Testament, it's here's the terms of the covenant. Keep the terms of the covenant. They walk in the blessings of God. God is faithful on his end. If they break the terms of the covenant, then they have repercussions, including the ultimate repercussions. The northern tribes of Israel having Syria take over. The southern tribes eventually having the Babylonians take over. And they went into captivity because they didn't keep the terms of the covenant. So if you want to understand the Old Testament, it all comes back to, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. Now, ultimately, here's the good news. God foresaw and knew that no individual or people group on the planet could keep this covenant. Everybody would have fallen short of this. Yes, there were some kings that did amazing. There were some prophets that did amazing. There were some individuals who did amazing. But none of them could perfectly keep this. So God steps in and says, I'll do both halves. I'll be God. I'll be man. I'll do my half. I'll do get man's half. I'll keep both. And the new covenant then was shed in his blood. And Jesus shed his blood to say, here's my blood of the sacrifice. Here's my blood of the commitment. Here's my blood of the covenant. So I want you to see that that was the agreement. That was why the Old Testament so often written the way it was. But all along the way, pointing to someone beyond. A Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, one sent from God who himself could keep the covenant on behalf of of the people. So let's look a little bit more at how does this apply to us? What does this mean for us as Christian believers? Number one, God is still a God of covenant. God didn't say, well, I'm a God of covenant with Abraham, and then I quit being a God of covenant. God is still a God of covenant. Secondly, God made a new covenant through Jesus Christ. And what was that new covenant? Number three, it was Christ shedding his blood, representing both God and man. Therefore, we don't need to shed blood anymore. He did it on our behalf. The law of Moses is no longer the covenant that we are to live by. Acts 15, 5, they had a big debate about this. The early followers of Christ were all Jewish. Christ means Messiah. He was the Jewish Messiah. The early followers, the early disciples were all Jews. And the Pharisees caused some trouble again. <laughs> but this time, these are believer Pharisees. These are not people who are against Jesus. They are people who are Pharisees who have believed in Jesus, like Paul in that sense. But unlike Paul in their conclusions, they go completely opposite of Paul in their conclusions. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. 
The church was at a crisis point. Which way would it go? Would this be the way it would go? Or would this not be the way it would go? Had they said yes to this, guess what everybody would be doing? But the Holy Spirit revealed to them this was not the way to go. And James said, no, I am judging through the Holy Spirit that this is not the path of God. The path of God is not to have the Gentiles be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And from that day forward, they made a decisive decision in the church that this would not be the path forward. There were some doing this previously, some not doing this previously. Obviously, Paul was already preaching his message. But there were some following this way. But then at this point, they made a decisive point where they weren't going back. Instead, they would say, that's not how you enter into covenant with God. So how do we enter into covenant with God, with Jesus Christ? It's by faith in Christ and his shed blood. But I still believe that the New Testament does offer us an outward sign. And I believe that is baptism. If you look at Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, they said, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. If you look throughout the whole book of Acts, when people come in, these were the original like Jewish people around from different areas that had come in for Pentecost, and they repented and they got baptized. But if you look as it expands in Acts uh, 8 to the Sumerians, they get baptized. Acts 10 to the Gentiles, they get baptized. Acts 19 to another group of people, they get baptized. This is the pattern throughout Acts. When people come to know Jesus as Lord, they get baptized. And then Paul wrote in Colossians 2, 11 through 14, in him you were also circumcised. Guess what? We still get circumcised. But look at how it's done. Not by human hands. It's not a physical outward circumcision. Instead, it says you were circumcised by Christ. By our flesh or our sinful nature. So we get circumcised in our heart. We get circumcised in our flesh. We get circumcised in the inward. But look at the very next thing he puts together here in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism. It's interesting that he connects those thoughts. That baptism is where we get buried with Christ. And we are raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So in 13, when you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code and nailed it to the cross. In other words, he took that old covenant and nailed it to the cross, said it is fulfilled. And we no longer need to enter into the circumcision or the law of Moses Instead, he said, you get circumcised in your heart by faith, by believing in Jesus. And the outward sign of saying yes to the covenant is to be baptized. So in the New Testament, that seems to be the pattern of how to identify outwardly in the covenant. When Gentiles previously got more proselytes, when they converted from being a Gentile to a Jew before Jesus, they had to do two things. They had to get circumcised, and they got a ritual bath or a baptism. Obviously, they didn't keep the circumcision part, but they kept the baptism part. In Matthew's gospel, when it ends, Jesus didn't say, make disciples of all nations, circumcising them. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the way we identify with the covenant, the way we outwardly show a sign, like the covenant of marriage, you would outwardly put on a ring to say, I'm in covenant with this person. The outward sign of the covenant is baptism. But there's another outward sign that God's given us, and that's in Matthew 26. This was through the Passover meal. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. 
Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks or blessed it, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Just poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And some even translate my blood of the new covenant. So what did Jesus do? He broke bread, and he took the cup of wine, and he said, Now this is a sign of our covenant. A sign of the covenant, the new covenant that I've made with you in my blood. Not in your blood, but in my blood. It's the perfect blood. It's the perfect sacrifice so that we can all have the forgiveness of sins, no longer needing to keep the law of Moses, but instead to receive by faith the grace of God and the shed blood of Christ. And that's another sign of the covenant. When we partake of communion, we are entering into the sign of the covenant and saying, I'm in covenant with God through the shed blood of Jesus. I'm in covenant with God through his broken body. So those are two outward forms. The baptism is a once and done. I do that for the rest of my life. It's a lifetime commitment. Just like circumcision was a lifetime commitment of never going back. But the Passover meal was an annual reminder for them of the covenant they had with God. And when we partake of communion, it is an ongoing reminder of the covenant we have with God through Jesus Christ. So my challenge for you this week is to commit to God on your side of the covenant. Abraham was to commit to his side of the covenant, which at that time entailed being circumcised. In our day is to believe and be baptized and to partake of communion. I encourage you to do that next time we offer it. And then worship with us next Sunday. <laughs> Pentecost Sunday. The holiday I continue each year to try to elevate more and more. Asher has a countdown going <laughs> in his room. How many days till Pentecost? I'm excited to continue to make that a bigger and bigger deal as we are walking today in this side of Pentecost with the power of the Holy Spirit and the ascended Lord Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you right now for your presence through your Holy Spirit. You are ascended on high. You are reigning from heaven today. And your Holy Spirit is among us. We are your body today on the earth. And you've entered into covenant with us because of the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that covenant. And we thank you that you are a God of covenant. And we thank you, God, that you keep your covenant. And that you did it for both of us. Your end and our end. When you shed your blood. Now, God, help us to do our part. Help us to believe. Help us to trust you. Have faith in that covenant if we have not already to enter into the sign of baptism or if we have to live out that sign and to partake of the bread and cup when we have it offered God we bless you and praise you today in Jesus name Amen, Amen. So to close out today we're going to sing about the blood of Jesus and ask ourselves that we received the covenant that he offers, 468, are you washed in the blood? Please stand.
God is a God of covenant. And we have the new covenant. And we are blessed by that God. So be blessed this week by the God who keeps his covenant and shed his blood for you. Thank you.